May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be aligned with your love, O God, our strength, our courage, and our freedom. Amen. Once upon a time, there was a man who was approached to make a contribution to his church's stewardship campaign. The visitors to his office spelled out the urgent need, and they made a compelling case, along with his essential role to their success. And then they made the ask, would you consider pledging $25,000 this year? The man responded, I understand why you think I can give $25,000. I am a man with my own successful business, and it is true that I have all the trappings of great wealth around me. But there are some things you don't know about me. Did you know that my mother is in an expensive nursing home? They replied, no, we didn't know that. He said, did you know that my brother died and left a family of five who have almost no insurance? They said, no, we did not know that. He said, did you know that my son is deeply religious? He's deeply religious and has gone, gone into social work and makes less than the national poverty level to meet the needs of his family. They said, no, we didn't realize that either. Then the man said, well then, if I didn't give any of them a damn penny of my money, why do you think I would give it to you? <laughs> Jesus tells a story this, in this morning's gospel about the importance of determination in our prayer, our faith, and in our work for justice in the face of that kind of moral blindness. Jesus tells the story as a way to communicate to you and me the importance of not losing heart, not giving up, and not fainting in our prayer, our faith, and in our work for justice. In Jesus' story, a widow keeps bothering the judge for justice for herself. And the judge is like the man in the story I just told. He cared, for not, he cared nothing for God or for other people. If I didn't give a penny of my money to my mother in her nursing home, my brother's widow and her five children with almost no insurance, and my son who lives below the poverty line, why do you think I would give money to advance God's life-giving work in the world. All of this brings to my mind the calloused hearts and absence of thinking that insisted that the government shut down week before last. There was no reasoning with the ideological fundamentalism which wanted to close the government, deprive 800,000 citizens of their jobs, and resulted in a loss of $24 billion to the economy during the 16-day shutdown. And risked damaging the full faith and credit of this nation. All because of an ideological objection to extending health care in the Affordable Health Care Act, which had already been signed into law and declared constitutional by the Supreme Court. The lack of thinking was grossly illustrated by Representative Randy Neugebauer of Texas, who himself voted for the government shutdown and then visited the World War II Memorial and harangued an innocent park ranger who was volunteering her time that day about closing the war memorial required by his voting to close the government and dress the ranger down in public before TV cameras saying to her that she and her colleagues should 
be ashamed of themselves. Now, I got kind of helped by Senator John McCain in what I considered some helpful advice. He experienced Representative Louis Gohmert from Texas charging Senator McCain, who opposed the shutdown, of, and he supported him, and he, he, oppo he charged him with supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria. And Senator McCain helped me. He said that he did not take offense because, quote, if someone has no intelligence, I don't view it as being a malicious statement. <laughs> now, Andrew O'Hare wrote, finally, and most deeply, how are we to understand the Confederate battle flag waved by a demonstrator outside the White House during this time. Some shutdown supporters fearing media blowback tried to suggest it was the work of a liberal agent provocateur <laughs> or simply a symbol of rebellious high spirits and quote unquote Southern heritage. But the meaning of that particular flag, the rebel flag, outside the home of our first black president, in the middle of a conflict loaded with not-so-hidden racial messaging is not difficult to grasp. He wrote, it strikes me as evidence that the heavy historical weight of slavery and what former President Jimmy Carter has called the burden of white supremacy has not yet been lifted from the national conscience. We ignore racism or we agree to overlook it at our peril. Jesus' story this morning about the importance of persisting, enduring, persevering in the face of moral blindness brings us, I think, to a very important question about our lives in this nation and in this world. How do we work to change things when our country, which is such a magnificent beacon on the hill in terms of opportunity and democracy, also is still in the grips of moral blindness about caring for and being in solidarity with the least of these in terms of education and health care and sufficient food for those who are poor, a comprehensive immigration policy and sane federal gun laws a blindness fed by the toxins of lingering and pernicious racism and white patriarchy and all forms of bigotry against women and LGBT sisters and brothers and those not of the dominant religions or those who out of self-protection have forsworn any religious affiliation. That is why this church continues to look at Jesus' values. We are a big tent here. We say we have many minds but one heart. We have a lot of different ideas about who Jesus was and about salvation and the Trinity and the virgin birth and the resurrection. But the fact is that all of us have and hold on to a core group of values embodied by Jesus. Like forgiveness and compassion and justice and nonviolence and inclusion for all. And Jesus says this morning in the gospel lesson appointed for today, don't forget perseverance. Perseverance is one of those divine values that when practiced gives a spiritual uplift and a transformation for every practitioner. For Jesus, persistence, endurance, perseverance is a faith issue. For Jesus, faith means not something that you carry around in a sack or a suitcase, something you have. 
Faith is something you do. You entrust your life. It means that you and I have given up the right to give up. For faith is to surrender your life to something that will prevail in the end. And that is the divine flow of boundless compassion. That is what will, it will win in the end. Domination will cease. Bigotry will come to an end. Discrimination, injustice, war as a means to solve problems, all of those will all come to an end because God has created a moral universe, the arc of which always bends toward justice and inclusion. To give up is human. To persist is divine. And in fact, to persist is to discover the divine flowing within you. Next weekend, we're going to be focusing on economic justice. And in preparation for that weekend, I've been reading a very important and agitating book from Robert Reich called Beyond Outrage, What Has Gone Wrong with Our Economy and Our Democracy and How to Fix It. Reich was on President Clinton's cabinet as the Secretary of Labor, and he gives eight things that we should keep in mind as we do our work to change this country and the world. The seventh is, he said it's perhaps the hardest thing of all, is to be persistent. He said, I don't mean that, and he said, it has an element of patience about it. I don't mean that you should be content or be willing to postpone what must be done, but you need to understand that altering the structure of power and widening opportunity require years of hard work as those who are toiling in the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts or who have been working for the rights of the disabled and gays would tell you it took 30 years of continuous fulmination for women to get the right to vote. 50 years of agitation before employers were required to bargain with unionized workers. Those who benefit from the prevailing allocation of power and wealth don't give up their privileged positions without a fight, and they usually have more resources at their disposal than the insurgents. So, take satisfaction from small victories, and don't be discouraged or fall into cynicism. And don't let others do so either. And don't allow yourself or others to burn out. I've known many activists who take a kind of masochistic delight in working themselves to exhaustion. Eventually their health suffers or their emotional resilience disappears. They reach a breaking point and cannot go on. These people don't know how to pace themselves for the marathon run of a political movement. And now I'm going to drop some names. <laughs> My wife and I have been invited to accompany a member of this parish to India two weeks from now. And I wrote our friend Archbishop Desmond Tutu to ask him if he would ask the Dalai Lama if he would receive Hope and me and this All Saints member while we're in India. And the Dalai Lama's people wrote back and said they would receive us. So two weeks from this coming Friday, I will represent you in a private audience with the Dalai Lama. So I've been reading everything I can get my hands on <laughs> by the Dalai Lama to figure out how this little country preacher should comport himself when he's in the Dalai Lama's office. And as this Holy Spirit would have it, I read something this week 
on perseverance. A psychiatrist interviews the Dalai Lama and says, genuine change occurs slowly and can take a long time. When change takes place so slowly, it's easy to become discouraged. Your holiness, haven't you ever felt discouraged by the slow rate of progress in relation to your spiritual practice or discouragement in other areas of your life? The Dalai Lama said, yes, certainly. So how do you deal with that? The psychiatrist asked. His holiness says, as far as my own spiritual practice goes, if I encounter some obstacles or problems, I find it helpful, helpful to stand back and take the long-term view rather than the short-term view. In this regard, I find that thinking about one particular verse gives me courage and help sustain, helps me sustain my determination. It's a passage from Buddhist scripture. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, may I too live to dispel the miseries of the world. Isn't that our credo here at All Saints? As long as we live, may we live to dispel the miseries of the world. And then the Dalai Lama speaks about his frustration about the oppression of China on Tibet. He says, here one needs to make sure that one's staying in immediate and active involvement. You never stop acting. Of course, in that situation, the struggle for freedom, when I reflect on the 14 or 15 years of effort at negotiation with no results, and this was written in 1998, when I think about the almost 15 years of failure, I develop a certain feeling of impatience or frustration. But this feeling of frustration doesn't discourage me to the point of losing hope. Pressing the issue a bit further, the psychiatrist asks, but what exactly does prevent you from losing hope? His Holiness says, even in the situation with Tibet, I think that viewing the situation from a wider perspective can definitely help. So for instance, if I look at the situation inside Tibet from a narrow perspective, focusing only on that, then the situation appears almost hopeless. However, if I look from a wider perspective, looking from a world perspective, then I see the international situation in which whole communist and totalitarian systems are collapsing, even when in China, there is a democracy movement and the spirit of Tibetans remain high. So I don't give up. You don't give up because God never gives up. So I close with calling to mind that first reading of Jacob wrestling with the angel or Jacob wrestling with a man, or Jacob wrestling with God. The Hebrew scripture is quite mysterious and appropriately so there. But Jacob sends both of his wives and all of their staff across the Jabbok. Just parenthetically, if any fundamentalist ever tells you that there's one biblical ethic on sexuality, just remember that Jacob had two wives that he sent across the Jabbok. <laughs> Close parenthesis. <laughs> God or the angel or the mysterious person rewards Jacob for being a wrestler with tangling and struggling and challenging all night long, perseveringly, and finally blesses Jacob with a new name, Israel, which means the one who wrestles, who wrestles with God and with other be beings, human beings, persistently. Every great relationship I know 
has wrestling in it. I have a great friend who's a leader here who, when he wants to challenge me, he says, now struggle with me here. Now wrestle with me here. Every time my wife and I wrestle, metaphorically, <laughs> our relationship goes deeper. Durability increases when you're able to wrestle with your friends also. A great deal of life is about wrestling. And so you and I are called to wrestle with God about what's wrong with this world. Now, Jacob turned Israel, limped away from the wrestling match because in the blessing, the angel or the man threw his hip out of joint so that he limped away. Every time I wrestle with God, something changes inside me. So you see, Jesus is saying that God is the God of boundless compassion, but make it your daily practice to wrestle with God. Go deep inside and know that God is there and that God is never going to give up on you and God is never going to give up on the human project. Say to God and to the universe in the end, I've got great plans, God. Why don't you get in line with my plans? And God says, I think it'd be better if you got in line with my plans. <laughs> and we say what Jesus said that night. He wrestled all night with God. Not my will, but your will be done. You see, you and I have a choice in life, whether we're going to trump, trumpet our own little projects, our me plans, or whether we're going to surrender to God's big picture, the we plans. My way or surrender to God's flow of abundant grace in life. At All Saints, we've committed ourselves to persevering, sustained work on gun control, on economic justice, on abolishing war, on dismantling racism, on congregational development where all receive an authentic welcome and a meaningful way to be engaged here, and to supply meaningful and compelling education and formation in the values of Jesus. That is what we invite one another to give to during this month of pledging. May our giving, may our living, may our wrestling here be in the spirit of joining the divine flow of abundant, boundless compassion. And in the process, may we all give up the right to give up. Amen. <laughs>